Well, hey there, it's Liz Moore from Real World NP, and you're watching NP Practice Made Simple, the weekly videos to help save you time, frustration, and help you learn faster so you can take the best care of your patients. So this week I'm talking about newborn jaundice, and full disclosure, these visits still make me a little bit nervous. So if after five years of practice, so if they make you nervous, that's it's totally normal. So I'm gonna in this video I'm gonna give like a broad overview, like a 50,000 foot view of like the general thing that I see in primary care in family medicine. And so the context is it's usually a three or four day old baby who's coming in for their initial check, and then they have some sort of history of jaundice or it's a newer onset jaundice. And it's usually in this video I'm talking about a 35 week and up uh, gestational age born baby, so late preterm or term infant. Um, and I'm also going to be talking about like kind of like what to be assessing, when to consider the other potential differential diagnoses, like what we're actually looking at here, and then like the tools and resources that I use to make those decisions going forward of in terms of the management and the follow up and all that stuff. So um, benign neonatal hy unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. <laughs> neonatal jaundice is an expected finding. So I just want to, uh, it's an expected finding with some caveats. So just pausing here for a second. So I want to talk about bilirubin metabolism. Uh, I am a super nerd and I love this stuff, but I'll try to make it real simple. Basically, and this may be a refresher for you anyway, right? So heme, hemoglobin is broken down. Heme is broken down into bilirubin, generally speaking, very broad overview. Um, it's brought into the serum with albumin, conjugated, no, sorry, unconjugated, <laughs> I always get them confused because the terminology is confusing. So unconjugated and indirect in the serum goes over to the liver. The liver breaks off that albumin. It's conjugated or direct, right? Because it's a directly just the bilirubin now and there's nothing attached to it. And then it's, that's like the processing and then it's excreted into the urine and the stool. And so for babies, for newborn babies, for the most part, they are have fetal hemoglobin breakdown and they have immature livers, right? So that's just, it's just overwhelming the system. Um, and so that brings to two, two different things. One, the main reason we care about it is because too much bilirubin gets across that blood brain barrier and can, ca and can cause neurotoxicity. And so what we're trying to assess is like, number one, is this expected an expected finding? How severe is it? Are they at risk for that neurotoxicity? And can they take care of it on their own? Can their body take care of it? Or do they need additional assistance? Um, so the main treatments, which brings me to the main treatments, depending on the underlying factors, which I'll get to in a second, is uh, PO intake, breast milk, formula, eating, stooling, urinating, getting rid of it, um, and uh, the other one is, is phototherapy. Um, so a couple of other, and, and I'll just pause there for a second, a couple other things I want to say first before we kind of get into the assessment stuff is that there is an expected peak. It's kind of like a, it's, it kind of goes on this like mountainous little, little peak and then back down again. And there's an expected peak post, post birth, um, in again, term, late preterm and term infants. That's about 48 hours to 120 hours where that's the expected peak. There's this little drawing, right? And so when we're, in, when we're interpreting the bilirubin results in the context of their physical symptoms, we're comparing it to those expected findings based on their time of birth and how many hours old they are, if that makes sense, right? So it's not just days, it's hours. How many hours from birth are we? And what is that bilirubin um, level? So that's a lot of information, but basically that's the, that's the background, right? And so when you, the context here is that it's a newborn baby that's about three or four days old who has some jaundice. Your job as a primary care is to just kind of like orient yourself, like where are we in this? So uh, jaundice tends to, um, present itself in a cephalocaudal pattern. Um, and so you want to see like how severe the jaundice is on physical assessment. Is a sclera involvement? Is it down to the chest, down to the navel, that whole thing? Um, and you also want to do your general assessment, right? That you're doing as a newborn visit, um, which I talked about in the last week's video. If you haven't watched that already, go back and do that. But basically what we're talking about is like, how are they eating, right? Because again, the treatment here is like, PO intake for the most part, right? This is not 100%, right? But like for the most part, there's PO intake and that's gonna help clear it on their own. Um, how are they eliminating? Do they have, have they passed meconium already? Do, what kind of stool do they have? What does it look like? Are they urinating adequately? How many diapers per day? Which I, again, I talk about in that video. How often are they feeding? Are they breast milk only, formula 
as well only formula like that is that is important to know as well and like how often how long like all that stuff and like I said I can I'm happy to bring on my uh, colleague who is a lactation consultant and I checked with her and she is interested maybe audio and not video we'll see um, if you have questions about that but um, but yeah so you're basically like assessing uh, what what their appearance is cognitively like right like neurotoxicity risk factors are they lethargic are they um normal like alertness again difficult to assess in newborn babies but always check if you need any any help with any of your colleagues right and then uh, talking about their elimination and then the next kind of important thing to think about is like what are the risk factors um and then how are you going to differentiate between um, physiologic expected jaundice and pathologic so a couple of thoughts about that so the differential diagnosis for pathologic jaundice for hyperbilirubinemia is really long so please consult your resources and just take a peek at that to kind of familiarize yourself with the potential differentials the main factors that will trigger you to think that it is more of a pathologic jaundice versus a physiologic jaundice is typically when it appears within the first 24 hours after birth there's like a rapidly rising level that's more than about five um, milligrams per deciliter per day i'm looking at my notes over here and then having a total serum bilirubin higher than 17 milligrams per deciliter in a full term full term newborn those are potential kind of like flags to think about those other options also if there's anything abnormal in your physical assessment or how they're doing um i i will ask right because for the most part when i see babies who are like this everything is expected findings right and they're eating ad adequately they're stooling adequately they have no other symptoms they have no neurologic symptoms like anything like that um but I, again, I always ask if I need help. So a couple of thoughts um, just to share about breastfeeding versus formula feeding. So you actually may see an exaggerated jaundice response um, for babies who are, are exclusively breastfed because of the relative caloric intake is slightly less. Um, as compared to formula because it's colostrum and waiting until the um, the milk production is coming in It doesn't necessarily mean that it's dangerous It's just something to, to keep into consideration The main thing that I find again the most common thing in primary care and family medicine is like making sure if they're not formula feeding uh, to make sure that their latch is adequate and that they're eating enough. They're, ta they're taking in enough because that's the cases that I've seen is that they're, they're breastfeeding and they're sort of doing well, but then they have some trouble in a, in a couple of days and then the jaundice gets worse and, and all that stuff. One other fun fact that I found is that the total serum bilirubin level, and I can link to this article down below, can be estimated clinically by the degree of caudal extension. So the face is five, upper chest is 10, abdomen is 12, and then palms and soles are is greater than 15. That is so interesting. I don't actually know the stats on that, but it's a reputable resource. So lastly, I just wanted to share the tool that I use. And so when I have babies who are like this, I'm doing my full assessment with that kind of background information in mind, and I'm looking at their birth history, I'm looking at their gestational age, I'm looking at um, the notes that they had in the discharge summary that will kind of clue you into earlier onset jaundice, what were their bilirubin levels then, like that kind of thing. Um, and then I'm going and using the Billy, so the billytool.org is the website that I use and I have no affiliation with them. It's just the one that I use and my whole clinic uses actually. And basically what you do is you plug in the um, date of birth and the time of birth and you plug in the, um, the, the, the time of the sample, like serum lab draw, as well as that bilirubin level. And it will spit out to you basically like um, what the risk what the risk level is and you need to interpret that in accordance with again your findings in front of you but additionally what are your other things to think about and so it will it will categorize it categorize it as low medium or high risk and that is further categorized by their potential risk factors as well as how old they are um, in terms of gestational age at birth and so I'm looking over at my notes here but uh, just so I don't like misspeak um, it's a free tool so I definitely recommend using it and I just have to say again full disclosure whenever I fill this out I'm just running my plan by somebody because I want to make sure that I'm not like uh, mis making a mistake or you know misunderstanding the interpretation because it's a little bit it's a little bit involved but it is really really helpful um, but yeah so some of the hyperbilirubinemia risk factors that would potentially increase their risk of a higher bilirubin level faster again 
the main thing we're thinking about is neurotoxicity. So if it gets too high, we need to bring it back down either with phototherapy or um, usually with phototherapy. <laughs> if it's getting too high, you need to do some sort of intervention. You can't just leave it on its own. But the risk factors to think about is if it's in a high risk zone, like how high the bilirubin level is compared to their date uh, and uh, time of birth, how many hours old they are. Um, if they had jaundice in the first 24 hours, again, if they had that, I'm consulting with somebody. Um, any ABO incompatibility would, would likely be already addressed on your discharge summary paperwork. But again, I'm gonna consult with somebody for that. Um, gestational age, 35 to 36 weeks. You definitely wanna be careful with that. They have, again, more immature livers. Um, if they had a sibling with prior photo therapy, any cephalohematoma or bruising. And then again, just keeping in mind with exclusive breastfeeding, it's not necessarily, it's not a harmful thing, of course, um, but it potentially increases, uh, it adds a risk factor, especially if they're not latching well, if they're not feeding well, if they have significant weight gain, weight loss, excuse me. Um, East Asian race is potentially a risk factor, but again, race is a social construct and it's a poor proxy for biological risk factors. Um, so loosely keeping that with a grain of salt. And then there are other some neurotoxicity risk factors which are a little bit like way less common and a little bit to get into on this video. But again, just consulting with your resources. So I'll link to both those resources, um, that article and uh, billytool.org down below this video. But hopefully this video is helpful. Um, if you have any questions, please leave them for me below. If you'd like to hear from my lactation consultant, physician friend, please let me know. I will reach out to her. And um, if you haven't grabbed the ultimate resource guide for the new NP, head over to realworldnp.com slash guide. You'll get these videos sent straight to your inbox every week with notes from me, patient stories, and bonus content that I really just don't share anywhere else. Thank you so very much for watching. Hang in there and I'll see you soon.